morning, everyone, and welcome to day seven of the SISCARI annual conference. Today is the second to last webinar of this year's eight-day virtual conference series. I'm Kevin Acker, research manager here at CARI. To start off, we want to acknowledge the generous support of our funder, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, without whom our work in this conference would not be possible. Since the first annual CARI conference in 2014, the event has become one of the premier places to present new, cutting-edge empirical research on China-Africa relations. The CARI conference provides a platform to feature the work of the current year's CARI research fellows and to bring them in conversation with other experts in the field. This year's conference, titled Strategic Interests, Security Implications, China, Africa, and the Rest, brings together a diverse range of scholars for a timely conversation on the security implications of China-Africa relations. This week's panels have explored the concept of Chinese sharp power in Africa and China's peacekeeping and humanitarian programs. The final panel of the conference, titled Regional Actors, Multipolarity and Comparative Perspectives, will be held tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Before I introduce today's panel and our discussant, I will briefly cover some basics. Speaker bios and additional information will be posted in the chat as we go. And if you have questions, you can type these into the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screens, and our panelists will do their best to answer as many of these as time permits. When you're typing your questions, please be clear to whom you are addressing your questions. Recordings of each day's event and today's event are being made available typically three to five working days after the event. All links will be on our website. Now on to today's panel. Today's panel is titled Commercial Interests and in Private Security Companies. And to introduce the panelists and their papers, I have the pleasure of introducing you to our discussant for the day, Dr. Marco Bajero. Dr. Marco Bajero's research interests focus on the political economy of development. He's the author of the book, The Governance of Private Security, which examines sources of changes and attitudes and social norms around private security and offers insights on the political economy and comparative politics behind security governance. With that, I will pass it off to Dr. Bajero, who will introduce today's panel. Thank you. Good morning to all. Uh, it is a pleasure to serve as a discussant of this panel, panel number seven, commercial interest and private security. It is for me a special pleasure to be back at Hopkins and to see friends and colleagues in this difficult, challenging year. Uh, a quick word, uh, just uh, my heart goes out to my mentor, Peter Lewis. He had a loss in the family. We love you, Peter. Looking forward to seeing you soon again. And now over to the presentation of the first speaker, Janet Eam. Janet is uh, an associate at EY Partner in London, where she works on corporate strategy and private equity focused due diligence projects. She was a former research manager at Size Carry and previously worked on China Africa issues in the strategy and policy unit of the Office of the President of Rwanda and at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Over to you, Janet. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, it's such a pleasure to be back here virtually um, in these interesting times um, from London. So thank you so much for hosting the panel today and looking forward to a really robust discussion. So um, I'm just gonna share my screen to share my presentation on Chinese engagement in Djibouti. Okay, great. So um, I'm pleased to share a bit today about my research uh, looking at economic and security impacts of Chinese engagement in Djibouti. This is based on some research that I conducted last year um, in the field, mostly field interviews as well as some um, project site visits. As many people know, there's been um, quite a bit of activity the past few years in terms of Chinese engaged projects in the region. Um, and there will be five key projects that I will focus on today. These are the Djibouti International Free Trade Zone, the Dorla Multipurpose Port, Dorla Container Terminal, which is also known as the SGTD Port, the Addis Ababa Djibouti Railway, and um, the Chinese Naval Base, which is also uh, very close to Camp Lumineer, which is the US base in the region. Um, and I think a lot of folks are very interested to know a little bit more about how these projects came about, um, some of the motivations behind their um, being set up. Um, and uh, just to give you a little bit of background before we dive into the individual case studies of the projects, um, one of the main players that I interacted with quite a bit while I was there was uh, China Merchants Group. They have been responsible for working with the Djibouti Ports and Free, Trade, uh, Free Zones Authority 
to set up the free trade zone as well as um, some of these port projects managing and operating them. So um, just to give a little bit of context, um, one of my observations was that uh, a lot of these projects that were set up had very commercial incentives behind them, both from the Chinese actors as well as the Djiboutian government. Um, in particular, just speaking to uh, the China merchants representatives and um, understanding their uh, motivation for coming to Djibouti in the first place. Um, we look at this port park city model that um, has been established in Djibouti and um, in some ways replicates uh, various parts of the port park city model that took uh, shape in China in the 70s. So um, these are cities like Shenzhen and Shiko, um, uh, Shanghai. Um, in 1979, China Merchants was uh, one of the main players behind uh, setting up the Chico Industrial Zone. But then um, sometime later, uh, because of overcapacity and basically a search for overseas profits, like many other companies, um, this going out strategy um, came to fruition and um, China Merchants made an overseas investment um, in a port in 2008. And then in 2013, they entered Djibouti, actually um, signing for a share of the Djiboutian Port Authority, which is known as PDSA. So um, that was sort of the conclusion that I came to was that a lot of these projects from the Chinese China Merchants side were commercially motivated. Um, similarly, there has been a lot of motivation from the Djiboutian government side, um, like many African countries having a strategic vision um, uh, this one is called Vision 2035, and the idea being that because of Djibouti's strategic location in the Horn of Africa, um, right along the Gulf of Aden, uh, Djibouti is hoping to become this uh, regional logistics and commercial hub. And they're very much actually gambling on the success of the hinterland economy, in particular uh, the Ethiopian economy, that powerhouse, um, and trying to become basically the vessel for a lot of exports and imports coming out of the region. So these two factors coming together um, are sort of the setup for these projects. So during the course of my research, I looked at several different questions. Um, the first one being the motivations of the actors, but also understanding a little bit about their agency, both in the negotiation process, as well as um, now some of the operations of the projects. This is important, obviously, because we wanna think about the longevity of the projects and um, how successful they will be for the Djiboutian economy. Um, which leads me to my next point. Um, some of the factors that I was trying to look at was looking at the economic impact of these projects. They are quite in an early stage, to be honest, but um, just looking a little bit at some of the decisions that were made around um, hiring of local employees, for example, or uh, different um, efforts to try and attract foreign investment. So looking at some of these factors can give us some clues into the future economic impact of these projects. Um, and what it means for all the financing that the country has taken on. And finally, um, of course, people are very interested to know a little bit more about the security implications of these projects and um, the connections to the naval base. So um, I will be touching on that as well. So to start off with, um, one of the first projects that I looked at was the Djibouti International Free Trade Zone. Um, this is currently in the pilot uh, um, uh, phase. So there'll be several different phases and um, the first phase will be a $350 million pilot zone. Um, China merchants, um, as I mentioned, working with the Djibouti Ports and Free Zones Authority, um, really being the creators of, of this zone. Um, the zone obviously uh, replicates a lot of other free trade zones um, in the region and also um, in, in China. And it, will be it's, it was interesting for me to see, um, first of all, talking about some of the agency aspects of, of this project. Um, the shareholding structure, they actually have two different companies that manage and operate this zone. So the first one being um, Edupo, which is the operations company. And the shareholding of this company is 40% um, Djiboutian and 60% uh, China merchants. And actually, this is reversed for the management company, um, which is called Great Horn Investment Holdings. And um, in this case, the, the Free Zone Authority actually has 60% and um, China Merchants has 40%. So um, at the time of negotiation, a bit of a deliberate effort to make sure that um, both parties had both management and operational um, responsibilities with the zone. Um, in terms of uh, the plan at the moment, uh, there have been some key aspects built in to try and ensure local economic impact. Um, the first one being around job creation. So um, 
in the first year of operations to try and make it easy for our firms to come to the zone and set up. Uh, the zone has not actually put any requirements in for, for hiring um, tribution workers. However, um, very quickly, uh, there are some standards put in place. So um, after the second year, these um, firms will be required to not employ more than 70% um, foreigners. And then actually by the third year, this becomes reversed. So I'm trying to ensure that close to 70% of, of their workforce will be Djiboutian. So these kind of efforts, again, are to try and create a positive impact, economic impact in the region. Um, in particular, Djibouti has a very high unemployment rate. So this is um, to help and mitigate that. Um, also, various incentives to attract foreign investment. So the idea being that um, uh, firms that are attracted to the zone will help to um, uh, create impact for other other industries in the area as well. So that's um, kind of on the economic impact. Um, from some of the security aspects, it's uh, hard to put a security risk to the zone at the moment, but one thing that I found interesting was that um, some of the firms that were in the zone were not entirely happy uh, with their experience. So one being uh, the Merrill Group, which is a huge logistics company in the region. They've been operating for decades um, in the Horn of Africa, and uh, they actually have been part of a um, port or uh, part of a zone in the old port zone area um, of, of the city. And um, basically, because the government wanted to um, create this zone and encourage firms to come to it, um, they moved over there to this new zone. However, um, the costs have not been as efficient as they had hoped. Um, they found that some of their leases were actually six times more expensive than they have in the old zone. The location has not been quite convenient for them. It's a bit out of the city center. So um, it just become more logistically difficult for them. And they felt that there wasn't as much consultation as they could have had um, in terms of, of being asked to move to this new zone. So um, in terms of some of the satisfaction of the firms, it has been a bit varied. The next project I looked at um, was this Durala multipurpose port. Um, so this is a, a port that um, in terms of the, in, after 2013, when China merchants uh, took a share of the Djiboutian Port Authority, um, this project came about. And um, because of the shareholding structure, um, China merchants was a minority, is a minority shareholder in this port. Um, one of the motivations, again, were, was very economically motivated for this project. Um, basically, there were a series of ports um, in an old port zone within the city and because of the anticipation of um, more cargo coming out of Ethiopia and, and um, this understanding that probably there would be a lot more trade coming through the region and that Djibouti could really capitalize on it, um, they decided they needed more space um, and, and they ended up building this um, new port. So um, that's been one of the major motivations and again kind of looking at the future and what the economic impact might be. Um, it's really uh, grounded in, in this um, vision. Um, one interesting thing about this project is that at the time, uh, pretty early on, one of the six bursts was actually designated for the Chinese Navy um, as part of an agreement for when the base was set up in 2015. So um, when we talk about agency, it's interesting that from the start, even though this is a commercial port, um, Obviously, there was something uh, reserved for uh, security dimension as well. Third project um, is the Durala Container Terminal, which is pretty well known for some of the controversy that it stirred. Um, so this is actually not a project that originated with China Merchants, but actually with DP World, which is a Dubai-based port operator. Um, in 2006, they received a 30-year concession to operate this uh, terminal. Um, and the Djiboutian Port Authority retained 66, so uh, majority uh, percent of shares. Um, then in 2013, of course, when the China merchants um, share holding took place, um, they ended up indirectly holding a share of this, uh, of this port as well. Um, shortly after that, uh, the Djiboutian government took a pretty um, bold step to pass a law uh, that stated that basically um, any management of what they would consider strategic infrastructure, however they might, that might be defined, um, could be renegotiated when the Djiboutian government felt that um, certain uh, economic independence was threatened. 
And um, pretty shortly after that, they um, ended up categorizing this port as falling into that category. This essentially uh, created um, a conflict between uh, DP World and, and the Djiboutian government. Um, there was a period of time when the government, Djiboutian government was trying to renegotiate the contract. Their main reason being that they felt that um, DP World, because of its other ports in the region, uh, was trying to divert some of the potential traffic that could come to this port to some of the other ports such as Jebel Ali. Um, at least that is the positioning that a lot of the Djiboutian officials that I spoke to took on. Um, and because of this, uh, the Djiboutian government eventually nationalized all the shares in this, in this port, um, and it is actually currently owned fully by the Djiboutian government. Um, shortly after that, uh, the, um, the uh, DP World uh, port operator actually ended up suing China merchants um, and accused the company of um, breach, uh, helping or inducing the Djiboutian government to basically breach um, exclusivity with DP World. Um, so this is very indicative, I think, of, of when we talk about agency and, and it can be mixed in some circumstances, but an African government really um, stepping forward when uh, they feel like they could get more um, agency in a deal uh, to actually take a very bold step of nationalizing a port. Um, so this is something that will be interesting to investigate further for sure um, when we talk about issues of agency. Um, the next project would be the Addis Ababa Djibouti Railway. Um, so this being a um, massive uh, railway project that would be connect or that now connects um, Addis Ababa to Djibouti and the idea being again this whole idea of the Port Park City model and trying to become um, a logistics hub. Obviously transportation infrastructure is very important for um, bringing exports and imports out of the region. So this being Basically, the idea being that these will be connected to all the ports. Um, um, it was connected to the free trade zone so that um, all of this cargo can move in an efficient way. Um, so that was sort of the motivation behind the project. Um, during the negotiations, when we talk about agency, again, it has been a bit mixed. Um, at the time, the Djiboutian side had actually uh, wanted to have uh, certain types of technical specifications um, around heavier rails and um, after some after some discussion they ended up not being able to implement that and instead um, the Chinese contractors decided to go with a cheaper option because it was more cost effective so there were some cases where where um, during the negotiation process the distribution side was not able to act enact as much agency perhaps um, in addition it's the railways has had some performance issues um, the lack of power has been a bit difficult um, because of some uh, flooding that had happened. The railway also <laughs> was derailed for a bit and um, all of these issues actually create a situation where the Ethiopian government renegotiated um, a loan repayment period for the loan and the Djiboutian side is actually currently in negotiations. So um, again this kind of shows the mixed impact of the project and, and some of the actions that are taken in response. Um, and finally I um, looked a little bit into the Chinese naval base as well. Um, the main conclusion that I came to when um, doing my research was that despite some of the concerns of, of the connection of this base to um, the, the ports that have come up um, in the region, China Merchants actually is very separate from, um, from the actors that have built this base. So uh, China, China Merchants being uh, commercially motivated in terms of port projects and um, actually not being very involved in some of the security aspects of the naval base. Um, of course, there are concerns that um, any any issues that come up with the ports might negatively impact the base because um, including the US base, including the Chinese base, all these foreign bases in the region, they do rely on these ports heavily um, for their logistics. Um, so um, that is a potential area that perhaps further research could um, look into and see what some of the future implications might be, some of the security um, implications of, of those connections. Um, and then, as many people will know, also just separate from the ports, these, um, the entry of the base has also caused some tension with other militaries in the region. Um, a couple of years ago, there were laser attack or accuse, accusations of uh, laser attacks um, towards uh, US military personnel. 
Um, so some of these um, tensions that might not have existed between other militaries in, in Djibouti um, have actually emerged in recent years. Um, so overall, looking at these different projects, there are several key takeaways that I came away with. Um, the first one, as mentioned, being that actually a lot of these projects came about because of commercial motivations. That is really, I think, key to the story of, of what we've seen happen in, in Djibouti over the past few years. Um, the second one being that agency has been mixed. Um, of course, at times it has been um, difficult for the Djiboutian government to enact agency. Um, they've had not as many partners perhaps that they, as they would have liked in terms of um, setting up port infrastructures. Sometimes their, their demands were not quite met. However, as we saw in the case of the SGTD port, um, the, the government also enacts a great deal of agency to, um, to essentially take over a port and, and run it on its own. So um, we, have to, we have to take a more nuanced view, I think, to agency. Um, the third being economic impact. The projects are quite in early stages, so it's very difficult to know at this point um, uh, what the future impact might be. But um, at this point, we've seen some issues such as with the railway come up um, in terms of power and profitability. And um, essentially, it'd be very important for uh, actors on both sides to be conscious of, of some of these issues that have come up and addressing them um, if they wish for these projects to be successful. And finally, looking at the security aspect of, of the relationship, um, it's interesting because if we look at the DP World case, um, where there was a port that had been set up uh, with an agreement and, and many years later, a renegotiation was unsuccessful. And in some ways, we could view that as a security risk if, um, if there are other cases in Djibouti that arise where, um, for example, with the DMP, if at some point, uh, the Djiboutian government wishes to renegotiate and a renegotiation is not able to happen. Um, obviously, any conflicts that arise related to the ports will threaten um, logistics and trade in the region, as well as supply to some of these um, military bases. So um, those are some of the aspects that we can look at in terms of security, as mentioned, um, also tensions between existing bases, uh, perhaps becoming more of a future risk. Um, so I hope that this has been comprehensive in terms of being able to understand a little bit more about recent engagement in Djibouti from Chinese actors. Um, and thank you so much. The attendees that can use the chat function to ask questions, some of you have started to ask questions, we'll deal with those at the end of the panel. The second panelist is Alessandro Arduino. Dr. Arduino is the Principal Research Fellow at the Middle East Institute, National University of Singapore. He's the Co-Director of the Security and Crisis Management International Center at the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences, and an external associate at the Lao Chao Institute, King's College, London. He's the author of several books, most recently, China's Private Army, Protecting the New Silk Road. Over to you, Alessandro. Thank you very much, Dr. Borgero. Uh, and uh, please, before start, allow me to thank uh, Sai Scari for having me today and for the great support uh, that I received uh, during uh, last year research uh, on the Chinese private security company in Africa. Briefly, in, in this uh, 15 minutes, uh, I would like to summarize some key points uh, and I will be glad to answer to your Q&A. Uh, during the last year research, uh, I was basically trying to answer a question how a uh, country that are not able or not willing to provide uh, a modicum of security to Chinese personnel, local stakeholder, mm -hmm. and Chinese infrastructure uh, were able uh, to, uh, in, a, in a matter, uh, define security and relate uh, to the problem of security. In this respect, uh, uh, the Chinese private security fill a gap, partially fill uh, the security gap. Uh, during uh, my time in Africa, I've been the chance to interview several Chinese private security company, local private security operator, as well as, uh, as uh, international regulator and uh, local regulator. Basically, the, the main difference from uh, the evolution of the Chinese private security 
in Africa is the fact that if we look uh, in the entire continent, uh, there is a wide range of threat uh, that uh, encompass political violence and criminal violence. In this respect, uh, the problem is not only related when China started to invest uh, along the Belt and Road Initiative, was always uh, uh, been a problem uh, during uh, the previous investment, especially from the private sector uh, in the mining field. Uh, on this respect, uh, during the early investment spearheaded by the Belt and Road Initiative, state-owned enterprises uh, were uh, believing that uh, the economic and security nexus uh, was just uh, uh, relying uh, on providing uh, the right economic measure and then security will come. Uh, this has not been the case. There has been uh, uh, a several and increasing number of incidents involving even the killing of uh, Chinese personnel. Uh, in, uh, in this respect, uh, uh, there is uh, in Africa, uh, as, as in other areas of the world, a growing number of actors that not only encompass uh, private security, but also private military companies and even mercenaries. Uh, for the sake of clarity, during uh, my presentation, uh, I'm just referring to the Chinese private security company as a company, private in, in a Chinese term, in a Chinese socialist market term, uh, referring to the fact uh, that uh, they provide uh, security uh, to the personnel, to the infrastructure, and mainly they guard the infrastructure against uh, theft or act of vandalism. There is, uh, in other respect, uh, a growing gray area in defining uh, private military companies uh, and mercenary operating in Africa, but uh, that's not the case uh, in, uh, in this research. Uh, Chinese private security started to grow as a trend uh, inside China and now this trend uh, is moving from the Chinese border uh, outside the country uh, all over the Belt and Road Initiative. But still uh, the Chinese private security are a kind of latecomer in the security market. Uh, and in this respect uh, uh, they still have uh, to grow capabilities local talents uh, and uh, operate uh, in an environment that is not a low risk environment uh, as it is uh, in, uh, in China, but uh, in a very complex uh, environment uh, abroad. And in this respect, uh, among uh, more than 5,000 slash 8,000 company that populate mainland China and account to more than 3 million of security official, only dozen of private security company are able, Chinese private security company, are able to operate outside the border of the People's Republic of China. Uh, if we look at the trend, uh, not only related to the overall Belt and Road Initiative, but at the specific trend in the African continent, uh, the private security sector in the African continent uh, have, uh, let's say, three peculiar characteristics. The first uh, is still the fact uh, that uh, in the continent uh, there is still a stigma associated uh, to the role of mercenary, especially the one in post-colonial conflict. Uh, in the 90s, for example, uh, private military uh, companies like Executive Outcome were operating uh, in various areas as uh, a, basically an army for hire. And the stigma of mercenaries uh, is still there, is still in Africa, and there is an increased number of uh, private military force uh, and mercenary force uh, uh, that are coming from different parts of the country and even from abroad, such as the case of uh, Wagner uh, private military company from, from Russia. Again, uh, the, the Chinese private security uh, sector uh, is moving slowly inside Africa, but in areas that uh, uh, are less complex uh, in terms uh, of security risk. Uh, the risk to the Chinese personnel uh, uh, are growing in several areas, uh, not much related to terrorist threat, 
as in that area there are not much Chinese investment, but mostly related to criminal violence and uh, an increase in kidnap for ransom. And in this respect, if we look at another point, is what kind of support the Chinese private security company can offer to the perspective in Africa. First and foremost, as I mentioned before, there is a need for filling the security gap that several state or local authorities are not able to provide. Uh, early uh, 2013, 2015, uh, most uh, of the state-owned enterprises, the Chinese one, with the exception uh, of the energy sector uh, and the mining sector, were just uh, relying uh, on consular protection. They soon realized that just calling the Chinese consulate or the Chinese embassy in case of kidnapping or in case uh, of act of violence. And in this respect, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, uh, is a fast changing environment uh, and the private security sector, Chinese one and international in cooperation with the Chinese uh, can offer a, a rapid solution to a fast changing problem and landscape. On the other side, uh, uh, the decades old principle of non-interference uh, uh, is still there, is going to change as uh, the security architecture in Africa is changing, but also the Chinese private security company are a mean to avoid uh, to have a stronger people liberation army or people armed police footprint in, uh, in other country if it's not specifically requested by that country. Then uh, it's also a support uh, uh, to the Chinese Minister of Foreign Affairs capabilities uh, in locating and protecting uh, Chinese uh, citizens. Uh, we can remember the evacuation in, uh, in Libya of several thousand Chinese workers, but then when there is a problem, and this problem is related uh, just uh, to a handful number of workers, uh, let's say just a few workers that are in a complex situation, then private security can provide uh, uh, support to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the, to the consular section of the Chinese consulate and embassy. And uh, this also increases uh, the resilience of the state-owned enterprises' understanding of the risk. While in several areas of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, there is not a particular risk assessment needed because the local country provide all the necessary law enforcement, in several other areas, and especially in the African continent, uh, this is not happening. And the state-owned enterprises uh, are under stress uh, to find uh, the proper solution to daily security issues. Uh, for example, uh, uh, there is a lot of attention recently on terrorist threat, uh, but one of the growing threats is piracy. And there are Chinese private security that provide uh, anti-piracy solution. While in the area near uh, Somalia, the, the piracy activity is, is dwindling, thanks uh, to the effort uh, of uh, the joint uh, military operation in other area, especially the one uh, in uh, East Africa, there is a growing threat of piracy uh, against uh, uh, civilian commercial vessel, as well as engineer working on oil platform. Uh, therefore, the Chinese private security company, all together with international private security company, and the international insurance sector are provide a new kind of service that are also upgrading the state-owned enterprises capability in assessing risk and in mitigating the risk in case of a crisis happens. Then most of the problem at the moment are, in my personal opinion, in related to two points. The first, uh, as I mentioned before, that is still most of the state-owned enterprises, even more compared to the Chinese private enterprises that started to operate way before in the African continent, 
is related to the fact that they tend to rely too optimistically on uh, Beijing for strong protection in case of a crisis. Uh, I've been interviewing several companies uh, and uh, their personnel appointed to crisis management uh, was basically uh, someone that was having another job function. The crisis management was just uh, a minor one and at the question what is going to happen in case of a kidnapping for ransom, for example, the answer was we take the phone and we call the consulate. Fortunately, uh, private security with professional capabilities, international private security, come in support of the Chinese private security. And also we don't have to forget that uh, uh, in Africa there are already uh, important well-established uh, uh, security association, such as the South African one, CIRA, for example, that uh, have uh, a long-standing uh, uh, culture in terms of training and certification, and the cooperation uh, with the Chinese partner is uh, extremely important. And then there are international bodies like ICOCA, the International Code of Conduct Association, that operate uh, in supporting transparency in promoting accountability for the private security sector, especially in the African continent. And uh, uh, some Chinese uh, uh, private security company are already looking at certificate with ICOCA. At the moment, uh, there is one uh, of this company that the one that operates uh, in, uh, in the anti-piracy. And uh, I had the chance to, to interview them. Having said that, uh, uh, one of the other problem is related uh, uh, to Apprising the risk. Uh, there is a need for proficient manager in order to mitigate uh, crisis, uh, prevent crisis, and in case of the uh, crisis happen, to manage it in the proper way. Unfortunately, no uh, private security company, and for this respect, I don't mean only. Uh, have uh, several issues related to this. One is related to the fact uh, that uh, most of the personnel, not only in China, but all over the world in the private security sector, come from the military or from the police. These are people that are used to train to use a weapon, but are also trained uh, to uh, say yes to their commander. While in the private security sector, uh, as a security manager, you are in a fluid environment and you don't have the chance to rely to the chain of command of control, you have to take a decision in a split second. And the mindset of most of the security officer is not uh, the right one. On the other side, uh, there is a need of linguistic capability, uh, personnel trained in several other areas of, of the security, private security spectrum, and it comes with a cost. And unfortunately, the Chinese private security sector, as well as several other private security sector, is marred by a problem of uh, low bowling in bidding and also trying uh, to uh, go for the cheapest option. And of course, uh, everywhere, but especially in the private security, uh, the problem is that uh, you, you get what you pay. Then if we move uh, lastly, uh, to conclude my, my brief, presentation uh, from what are the arrival point to what is in, in, the, in the crystal ball are going to be the trend of uh, the private security sector in, uh, in Africa. Uh, there will be an increase and in competition among several Chinese private security company uh, now and in the coming years as the mainland market uh, is shrinking. Still, uh, the mainland market for security in China is raised to the bottom and uh, the margin that these companies are having is narrowing by the day. So all these companies see as the Belt and Road Initiative and especially the Belt and Road Initiative in the African continent uh, as uh, uh, a lucrative market. Unfortunately for most of them, capabilities, uh, the right pricing of the risk uh, is not there. Professional company come at a higher cost. So sometimes uh, uh, even from myself, it's too easy to point the finger at the private security sector accusing for uh, low bidding, while there are very professional private security that complain to the fact that their client are not uh, willing to pay the right price uh, for their security service. 
in, uh, in this respect, uh, uh, the problem surface uh, when uh, uh, some, something very bad happened or uh, when there is a loss in terms of reputation or, uh, or asset. But then at the moment, only few of the Chinese private security company among the several thousand are able to operate with confidence uh, abroad. Uh, what we are going to witness in the future that is not too far is uh, a better integration uh, with the international security community, not only in the private security sector with uh, famous international company from the United Kingdom, Israel, or even the United States, but also in the security, in the in insurance sector, uh, a sector that promotes insurance in very niche area, such as uh, kidnapping and ransom. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, the Chinese private security are a late comer in uh, the private security sector arena in Africa, but they have uh, one uh, advantage compared to their peer is the fact that they can use uh, uh, UAV unmanned aerial vehicle and uh, specific uh, high technology for security like AI enabled camera at competing price uh, and they can act uh, as a kind of ambassador for the Chinese uh, high tech security company that produce uh, this equipment uh, to be used and, uh, and sold abroad. And with this, uh, I would just like to conclude my presentation and to thank you. Actually, this is all fascinating and I look forward to the Q&A. Uh, now we turn over to uh, Xu and Zheng uh, and uh, Yang Xia. Mrs. Zheng recently graduated from the Johns Hopkins size with an MA in international relations, concentrating on international economics. Before coming to size, she worked in Kenya and Tanzania for about two years. She currently works as an RA in the Department of Economics at SAIS. Dr. Ying Xia is an assistant professor in the Department of Law at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, she received her SJD from Harvard Law School and LLM in International Law and LLB from Peking University. Her doctoral thesis examines the socio-legal implications of Chinese investment in African countries. We we'll look forward to your presentation. Over to you, Xu Wen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bagaro, for the introduction. So, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Xu Wen Zhen. Uh, let me share my screen first. Okay, so before I start my presentation, uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, thank, thanks again for uh, Sai Scarry for the great support for this research project, and thank Dr. Park for all the editing suggestions for my paper. Uh, it was a really great learning opportunity for me. So today, uh, our paper is actually a case study of the pr private security companies in Kenya and the impact of Chinese actors. So I will start the presentation and Dr. Ingxia is my mentor for this research project and she will make a final comment at the end of this presentation. So the reason for us to do this case study is that following the rapid expansion of China's commercial and political activities in Africa, uh, Chinese citizens and assets are exposed to the threats of terrorism, uh, civil unrest and anti-Chinese sentiment. And all of these incidents made security a priority in the African continent. So for Chinese policymakers, risk management in overseas security protection has increasingly evolved as an integral part of the going out um, policy framework. So the big question following this um, a security framework is that who should provide security for Chinese citizens? So uh, to answer this question, we adopt a qualitative uh, research method um, to, do, uh, to first do a literature review and followed by a one month field work in Ke uh, Nairobi, the capital of Kenya. Uh, so we were be able to conduct uh, interviews with uh, transnational private security companies, with Chinese security companies and um, private security industrial associations and also labor unions. Okay, so, uh, so first, uh, the first part is a general review of the development of um, private security industry in Kenya and, and, and in Africa. So uh, on the demand side, as the uh, other 
fellow researchers have already mentioned, the growth of crime and the rise of private security industry has coincided with the erosion of state capacities and services. Uh, actually, the declining government expenditure uh, among African governments results in a declining quality of public services. So, uh, as uh, data shown here in the bullet points, the global average number for police to civilian ratio is about 1 to 400. But in Kenya, the ratio is 1 to 1,250. So you can see the, the great discrepancy uh, in terms of the ratio. So on the supply side, the private security has become a lucrative market. So the global market for private security services, including private guarding, surveillance, and armed transport, was worth $180 billion in 2016. And it was part projected to grow to $240 billion by 2020. So as you can see in this graph, uh, overall speaking, there's a growing trend in uh, the global security market. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't find any uh, valid source for the African market alone, but uh, the overall trend should be uh, similar. Okay, so uh, when it comes to China, um, according to the data from uh, the official, uh, official government website, uh, about, three, uh, about 30 thousand Chinese enterprises are located overseas and more than on average more than 100 million Chinese citizens travel abroad annually. So as shown in this graph in 2018, the PRC Council Affairs reported a total of um, about 40 thousand assistance and protection cases. And uh, as you can see from the uh, uh, left hand graph, um, the protection cases reported by PRC Council Affairs is uh, growing over the years. And according to the data we collected from 2006 to 2016, over the 10 years, there were about 300 reported cases of, of violent attacks, including terrorist attacks against overseas Chinese workers that led to nearly 1,000 deaths and injuries. So the actual numbers must be much higher. And those incidents catalyze the changes in China's foreign policy. So because for the time being, PLA is not deployed overseas to protect Chinese companies and citizens. So, China, uh, so Chinese private security companies are stepping in to take the responsibility. Um, about now, China have about uh, 3,000 um, private security companies protecting about uh, one 16,000 companies operating abroad by 2016. But this number is still small compared with the major uh, global security service providers like, um, like G4S. Okay. So uh, in terms of the regulation, the regulation of Chinese uh, PSAs only started recently and it is not fully developed. So summarized by a report from the Mercator uh, Mercator Institute for China Studies, as shown here in the bullet points, uh, security regulation in China's global engagement presents challenges for both Africa and traditional Western um, private security companies. So as you can see from these uh, timelines, um, the first law regulating domestic Chinese private securities were not issued until 2009. And this law has not been amended until 2018. So naturally, uh, Chinese private securities operating overseas are in a legal gray zone because since Chinese domestic law does not apply to their international activities and international law lacks regulation. So after a very general uh, review, um, our research turned to map the private security market in Kenya because Kenya is one of the uh, investment center, um, a Chinese investment center in Africa. So um, private security firms first emerged in Kenya in about uh, 1960s. In the past 10 years, the outbreaks of the post-election violence of 2008, 2013, and 2017 drive the expansion of private security industries. So private security is one of the biggest employment sectors in Kenya. Um, there are about uh, 500,000 security guards employed in about um, 2,500 uh, 2, uh, private security firms. But according to our field work, uh, there are only 600 companies are currently active. 
and among which about 150 are transnational companies. Uh, so what happened to the other 1,900 companies that they are most local uh, formed companies and they're collapsing due to the non-payment problem um, caused by the Kenyan government. So um, one thing to note is that within this uh, huge market, only five Chinese owned private security companies are uh, find uh, existing currently. So uh, within the Kenya private security market, the leading uh, KK Security and G4S dominates the market. So KK Security is actually a local company. Uh, it currently has 11,000 uh, 11, staff in Kenya. And now KK Security uh, is officially acquired by Garden World, which is a private owned security company from Canada. And on the other hand, um, G4S is a major competitor to KK Security. Um, as known for many of you, it is one of the world's largest private security companies, and it has about 15,000 employees in Kenya. So a typical private security company usually has four major business types, armed transportation um, for cash service for banks and logistics, and also main security services, uh, risk consulting and tracking services. So uh, usually speaking, the biggest profit source is from transportation and tracking services, but men security contribute the most in terms of creating uh, jobs. Um, okay, so now let's um, focus on the research on the uh, existing Chinese um, private security companies. So um, as you can see from the summarized table, uh, there are five acting, uh, there are five existing Chinese private security companies. Um, uh, namely, they are um, from Frontier Service Group, on Doorway Security, China Security Technology Group, Dragon Security, and Riskin International. Um, and as a matter of fact, the only, uh, the first three is the only active one in the market. Um, so for uh, Dragon Security, it has been suspended due to the uh, immigration issues. And for the Riskin uh, International, uh, we, we can only find its information online. No physical offices was found uh, in Nairobi. So as you can see here, they're all uh, operated in a relatively small business scale. And um, um, uh, some of them are still in the process of registration. So because there are only three active uh, private securities uh, in, Nairobi, in Kenya, so our case studies would be focused on these three companies. So um, our first case study tried to figure out Chinese private security struggles in the private security market uh, in Kenya. So as a typical Chinese uh, PSC, uh, this company, China Security um, Technology Group, is characterized by a small business scale in terms of the number of clients and its employees, and also the PLA military background of its founders, um, and also um, in terms of CSTG, managers and security officers on a core management team have all previously engaged in peacekeeping or um, disaster relief in de developing countries and also strong government connections of the parent companies and a project-oriented operation uh, in a foreign market. So, uh, so CSTG's Kenya office is located in a private villa in Nairobi, and the training provided to local security guards is very informal. As you can see uh, in this picture, this is actually their office and also the training site. So uh, there are several uh, restrictions that make business le uh, legalization a long process in Kenya in terms of company registrations. So first is uh, this Private Security Regulation Act, which was issued in 2016. So it requires that at least 25% of shares in private security firms should be held by uh, Kenyans. So these restrict foreign participant participation um, in the private security sector. And the second is this uh, Liberal Relations Act, so this act states that the minimum wage in the private security industry should be about uh, 130 per month. And this number would be changed based on Kenya's cons uh, consumer private, uh, price index. Um, and third, um, due to the constant changing policies released from the uh, regulating office, so 
typically a foreign private security company uh, would took more than one year to get the certificate of uh, registration. So because most, uh, because for CSTG, their strategy is to target at a uh, Chinese client, but most Chinese companies are located remotely in suburban areas. So most of them chose to work with the closest security companies to save the budget. Uh, as a result, this strategy does not work on the ground. Um, so uh, our second case study tried to explore the possibility of international uh, corporations because the lack of understanding of local polit politics and sensibilities have prompted many Chinese security firms to seek foreign partners when undertaking uh, overseas projects. So for this particular case, um, 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 the Frontier Service Group is funded by Eric Prince, who, is, uh, the, uh, who created Blackwater. And um, in 2015, China International Trust Investment Corporation has acquired major shares of FSG. So that um, now uh, FS, FH, FSG is act as, um, um, would act for the government responsibility uh, as the flagship Chinese overseas security guard. So, um, FSG has a very integrated uh, security service system at, in the early stage, but now um, it's still hard for them to uh, earn profit. Uh, so this is because that um, um, for Chinese clients, the security budget is usually one to two percent of total budget project value, um, but for uh, which is far less than the international conventions, usually three to five percent. And for international clients, although contracts from UN are worth millions of dollars, uh, FSG currently has not had an outstanding advantage to compare with other uh, private security companies. So our third case study, which is the uh, most important case study, um, um, tried to focus on the safeguarding of the Mombasa Nairobi Standard Guard Railway, which is SGR. So um, implement, implemented by the China Road and Bridge Corporation, SGR is the largest infrastructure project in post-independence Kenya, which worth about $3.2 billion. So SGR security work is dividing, is dividing into two stages as shown in this table, construction and operations. And they both have involved Dovey's uh, security's participa participation. So as shown in this table during the construction period, security was the corporate responsibility for uh, the China, Chinese side, CRBC. So it actively undertook initiatives and cooperation with the Kenya, Kenya police went more smoothly. But during the uh, operation period, the Kenyan government is supposed to take respons responsibility for ensuring security as part of the public services. But as, fact, um, as a matter of fact, uh, CRBC insists that uh, SG operation per se is a public interest activity. So everything uh, they're doing right now uh, is kind of fall, fall under social responsibilities. So they're still waiting for uh, the Kenyan government to take responsibilities in terms of the budget and the management. So as listed um, on the red, red, uh, right, hand, right hand side, uh, so the challenges mostly come from the switch of responsibilities from between two periods. So during the construction period, staff increased or contracted with um, tremendous flexibility based on the project needs. But on the operation period, safety management is a continuous activity. So the management team is tasked with covering the entire railway line and even neighboring uh, areas. So uh, for these um, case studies, the major takeaways are first, a doorway security plan during the construction period shows a strong resemblance of PLA military deployment. So the security system has four layers, actually. A chief security officer plus one party secretary um, who reside in Nairobi, 10 security officers, um, each responsible for supervising security affairs at one construction division. And below that, uh, there's three to four dozen uh, subdivision security officers who is responsible for respective um, sites. And uh, finally, there are about 2,000 security guards. And in this set setting, private security is not simply a junior partner to the state, but instead act like a key component uh, in state forces uh, operations. And secondly, 
operations of uh, CRDC, the Chinese side, working with the Kenyan government, the private security companies, and the police force required a very high degree of cultural sensitivity and diplomatic skills, so which could be considered as a delicate task. And third, uh, the Kenyan police are paid supplementary, uh, supplementary wages by the Chinese company, supervised by local private security officers, but continue in principle to take orders from their police commanders. So this would create an interesting contradiction of public and private uh, authority and responsibility. So additionally, CRBC has realized the importance of uh, localization and community engagement. It mainly focused on raising protection awareness among local communities through public education. So for media relations, since uh, CRBC, as I mentioned before, CRBC thinks that they're doing social responsibility for the operation, so there's no need for extra media exposure of corporate social responsibility. So before uh, I reach the conclusion, one thing to note is that um, what we mentioned in this paper is the challenges in the process of private sec uh, public security privatization in Kenya. So uh, as the literature I've already reviewed, privatization, outsourcing, and public-private partnership have become commonplace since the 1970s. So in this case, private security companies would serve as a third sector of um, security provision, operating alongside the state's policing and uh, institutions. So in Kenya's case, the major problem through this process uh, is the asymmetry in public security and private security. So, um, in often cases, security guards in more and more cases have to conduct various risky missions, making industry uh, standardization an urgent task. So naturally, to put in order in the private security market, there's a lobbying process involving um, topics like training curriculum design, minimum wage struggle, whether security guards should be armed or not. So these conflicts, uh, and also the conflicts between small local uh, private securities and large um, transnational companies become increasingly severe. So uh, based on our interview, uh, the labor unions and also the industrial associations would agree that uh, the competition should squeeze out these informal uh, local private securities to make the market more uh, formalized. So in this process, Chinese companies remain silent during the lobbying process. Since lobbying is not a common practice in domestic China, so such silence is still part of the learning curve. And uh, Chinese private securities, just like other Chinese investors, um, they should realize how critical uh, local NGOs and industrial associations can be in the lobbying the government. And they should notice the significance is, uh, behind these uh, negotiations. So um, um, I would uh, give the floor to Dr. Insha to draw the conclusion and make a final comment. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to thank uh, the Curry team for having me today. Uh, it's, uh, it's very good to be, to be back virtually at a Curry event. And uh, my role here in this particular project is mainly a supervisory one. And congratulations to Shu Wen for completing this very interesting research. Uh, in the interest of time, I will limit my uh, reflections to, to some, a few very concise ones. The first point I'd like to highlight is the paradigm shift in China's official policy regarding the role of uh, security issues. So even though uh, early Chinese foreign policies have uh, touched upon issues of security, uh, these policy guidelines from early years have mainly limited to um, issues such as the personal uh, concerning the personal safety of overseas Chinese employees. And they have a strong emphasis, a strong orientation towards uh, consequence, meaning that the Chinese government will only pay attention to large scale incidents such as strikes that have uh, concerned the national image of, of, of the Chinese state. Uh, since 2016 or 2017, with the deepening of China's outward economic engagements under the banner of the Banner Road Initiative, there has been an overall increasing emphasis on, um, risk on the concept of risk management. And this is manifested by, for example, the increasing emphasis put on legal compliance, which, is now, uh, which has now become an important factor in the evaluation of performance of Chinese managers in state-owned enterprises. 
And at the same time, the definition of risk has also been, um, has also been expanded to include uh, not only political risk and economic risk, but also legal risk and security risk. Um, and with that said, um, it takes time for this paradigm shift to penetrate underground practices and to shape effectively the behavior of Chinese uh, companies and their logic of operation. For example, uh, Chinese enterprises, um, in terms of legal compliance, Chinese enterprises, especially small to medium-sized enterprises, tend not to include the cost for legal compliance when calculating their economic profit. And that explains why, on the one hand, we see a rapid surge of Chinese investment of varying sizes pouring into Africa in recent years. But on the other hand, enormous fluctuation in those investment activities once they've been established in host countries in Africa. And in the area of um, private security, um, there are similar issues that Chinese investors are gradually but slowly shifting from um, ad hoc uh, crisis response type of risk management to a more systematic and long-term oriented planning and prevention of risk in, in their um, investment strategies. And this background um, also explains the pattern of operation of Chinese private security firms in Kenya. And because uh, many of Chinese small and medium enterprises have put inadequate attention and resource to security issues, um, so far, most of Chinese uh, private security firms operation have been limited to a few large scale and high valued projects, mostly pioneer steered by um, state owned enterprises from China, such as the one we've seen with the Mombasa Nairobi Railway. And, and this also explains why we've had this and um, other Chinese private security firms like the Frontier Service, which has some linkage to the infamous Blackwater. And this company have found to be more opportunistic in some way meaning that um, it uh, does not have, so far it doesn't have a um, strategic plan for long-term investment in private security, but has diversified its investment in other areas such as construction or insurance, and many other um, um, sectors in addition to security provision, which is supposedly to be its main uh, function in Africa. And um, last point is, um, is given the resource constraints and the lack of experience of Chinese private security firms in Kenya, uh, a lot of the projects we've seen are uh, undertaken in a form of collaborating with existing market players, especially those European uh, private security firms that are already been in the Kenya market for decades uh, prior to uh, the establishment of this Chinese operation. And there are both advantages and disadvantages for collaborating with existing market players. On the one hand, it may contribute to capacity building for Chinese private security firms in Kenya. But on the other hand, it may also reduce the incentive for Chinese security firms to invest in developing its own local networks or invest in local training, especially when some of the investors are more opportunistic. And, and, and I pass the floor back to, to Marco. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ying. Uh, I want to remind uh, the attendees they can post questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, now we are going to proceed with uh, my comments. Uh, and in the last 10 minutes, we'll address your questions. Uh, I think all the presentations were fascinating, and I'm going to cover four aspects. One is the drivers of growth, the market actors, including trade unions, norms and regulation, and the historical analogies. Uh, and I will ask uh, you to uh, give your comments to these uh, four areas. Regarding the drivers of growth, uh, we have seen uh, global private security developing in the aftermath of the war on terror. And generally the literature gives uh, a few explanations for this increase. Government's unwillingness to intervene, neoliberalism, changes in the availability of military supply and personnel, and then technology, and also uh, warfare, changes in warfare. 
Now, what are uh, the different dynamics that we see here? Uh, Dr. Arduino mentioned China's domestic market dynamics. So this is a, a distinct new uh, driver. Presentations also emphasize the role of violent incidents uh, in a very interesting way and in how they catalyze change, including in China's foreign policy with a strategic reassessment of the longstanding principle of non-interference. Dr. Arduino studies shooting incidents in Zambia, miners' deportation and kidnapping. Zheng and Xia analyzed data, 300 recorded cases of violent attacks between 2006 and 2016. Uh, of these, 54 kidnappings. Now, how do these single events resonate domestically and uh, how do they explain larger dynamics of contracting? Over to you, Janet, then Alessandro, and then either Shuan and Ian. Any. Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much. Yes, I, I think these are some great questions that have come in. Um, so in terms of drivers, at least in the cases that I saw, um, as I had mentioned, it's definitely these commercial incentives that actually um, have created the relationship that we've seen um, in, in Djibouti. Um, so I would say that maybe compared to some of the other cases that panelists have presented where um, security incentives were uh, there from the start. Um, in the case of Djibouti, we saw a lot of the projects um, start off in ways that we see other infrastructure projects pop up throughout Africa. Um, and it is just that um, with, the, with the creation of the naval base and um, some other um, security components that have entered afterwards that um, we've seen that dimension come about. So I would say still a lot of the commercial incentives are quite at play. Yes, uh, basically, uh, as you mentioned, we have to look at both the trend and the single case. Uh, one of the first pictures in my presentation was referring to the attack uh, in the Blue Radisson Hotel in, in Bamako, in Mali, in, in 2015. And during that attack, uh, uh, three top managers of Chinese Railway Construction Corp, state-owned company, were gunned down by terrorists. That was a moment in which, in China, the issue of security and protecting Chinese uh, was uh, extremely important. Uh, it resonated uh, uh, on all the media and the social media, and even President Xi Jinping itself uh, addressed uh, the problem. Then uh, there is uh, a large number of violent attack accident uh, that build up uh, increasing uh, the, the trend uh, and of course the necessity in providing proper security. So uh, in my answer, in a nutshell, there, is, there are both these components. The growing trend for necessity security, especially uh, now that the Belt and Road Initiative uh, footprint uh, is expanding in Africa. And uh, uh, there are two mainly related problems and they're all referred to perception. Perception of the risk, if the company perceives properly the risk is going to pay, but it doesn't perceive a risk uh, there is uh, no willingness to pay for that. And then we have the problem for private security being not professional, not accountable, or not having enough resource. And another is the perception from the receiving side of what China can do. And sometimes uh, these kind of uh, requests are not met just because uh, the local perception is overestimated and it can create uh, local friction between local workers local population just because the expectation were not there uh, uh, i can go first so i think uh, as uh, my fellow researchers already mentioned both the dynamics in China's, Chinese market and African markets matters a lot. So I just want to add one more thing. So in terms of the uh, case report uh, of the violent attack, um, according to uh, the data we find, uh, for example, in 2018, um, the Council of Affairs reported about 14,000 assistance and protected cases. And of these, only about 2,500 are actually from Sub-Saharan Africa. But such a low case report rate might result from the public distrust, distru distrust of uh, African governments, for example, for the long existing corruption problem. And also um, maybe it's due to the problem that uh, Chinese embassies is limited influence in local communities. So um, in actual cases, 
the influence of uh, this uh, value in tech might be much higher to give the catalyst effect for the development of private security uh, industries. Okay, a few quick points. So in terms of commercial incentives, I would say yes, there is definitely a huge market potential for the development of private security industry in, in, in China's overseas investment. Um, it is estimated that by 2050, the market for a private security uh, for Chinese outbound and road uh, related activities has amounted to over uh, $10 billion. But uh, at that year, only about 10% of those revenues have gone to Chinese private firms. And we've also seen from Shuwen's paper that among 150 foreign security firms that are currently operating in Kenya, only five are linked to Chinese investment. So taking uh, into account the uh, China's contribution to Kenya's FBI, FDI and in general, the FDI inflows from China to Africa more broadly, this is very disproportionate compared to China's contribution to private security provision in the African market. So I'd say that there's definitely a great commercial incentive that's driven Chinese private security firms to develop in Africa. But on the other hand, I would say that uh, more government coordination efforts are also required. As we've seen in the SDR case, uh, there's definitely more that needs to be done by the government because after all, the provision of security is not only a commercial issue, it is also a uh, issue of public security and, and public goods. And especially when it comes to large infrastructure projects like, like the SDR. So definitely there is uh, the African government and the Chinese government, they have to make a better effort to clarify uh, their respective role in the provision of public security and also to delineate the uh, nonprofit part from the, prof uh, from the commercial part of uh, security provision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is uh, all fascinating. Uh, I would like to move now to the study of market actors, including industry associations and trade unions. Uh, trade unions in particular are interesting because they can paralyze entire sections of the economy and uh, they can cause strikes, including armed strikes. Mobilization has indeed turned violent. Uh, there was a violent strike in 2006 in South Africa that lasted three months. So in an industry that is so reliant on labor, as we've seen uh, in Kenya, uh, and we see elsewhere, uh, what does the research suggest on uh, recent patterns of uh, mobilization and uh, what can we expect? Uh, over to you, Janet. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely uh, an important component and especially um, on some of the agency aspects that I spoke to in my presentation. Um, so far, the case study that I conducted in Djibouti, we haven't seen um, too many um, uh, protests or uh, forms of, of disc, um, discontent amongst amongst distributions um, on the projects. But um, as I mentioned, there are some cases of, of individuals or, or groups that um, have been operating a certain way for many, many years um, with the logistics infrastructure that has been in place. And now because of some of the changes that have been coming out with the Port Park City model and, um, for example, the individual that I spoke to you about in the Djibouti International Free Trade Zone, um, there have been some um, um, complaints uh, around how things are um, turning out uh, with the changes. So that's one aspect that I'd like to touch on. And another thing is, um, I think we kind of have to look at the longer history of the projects and that oftentimes is not just um, the, the Chinese uh, counterparts that we're looking at, but as we looked at in the case of Djibouti, there's multiple foreign port operators that have operated there and um, various iterations of those products have created conflict and um, uh, uh, concern amongst local actors. So um, we can understand that it's not just for uh, the Chinese projects, but um, a lot of other projects that have um, taken hold in the region that might also uh, stir up some strong opinions amongst various actors. Yes, from, uh, from my point of view, uh, basically we are looking uh, in the private security, not only at the Chinese private security in Africa, but the overall sector that is a sector that is labor intensive. Having said that, uh, uh, is a labor intensive, but characterized by a kind of minimum wage that is not even enough uh, and uh, is always related to a race to the bottom. So most uh, of the security official, the security uh, operator that guard uh, uh, infrastructure uh, or protect uh, 
uh, workers uh, uh, are in that kind of job uh, in a kind of in between waiting for a better working opportunity, uh, waiting for another kind of job offers. There is not uh, a clear career pattern in the overall private security sector toward uh, a, professional, a professionalization that one is well paid and second is recognized. If we translate this necessity uh, to the Chinese private security market, then the question is when you have uh, a, a security manager, that it means someone that is capable to understand the risk, assess the risk, manage a risk, and speak several languages, and is a capable manager, uh, why he is willing to move from area like Shanghai or Beijing or Shenzhen when he can find a job in the Fortune 100 and have to go in very high, unstable and volatile area. And that's one another problem in finding the right person for, uh, for the job. On this uh, uh, one trend uh, that is going to diffuse the problem of labor intensive in the private security is coming just from the private security firm from China and is the use of AI enabled CCTV and automatization of some security function. It is going to improve capability it is going to reduce uh, some of the cost, uh, but at the end, at everything that is related to security, you always need the boots on the ground. One more minute. If, if uh, you can do it in the space of one minute, and we'll wrap it up. Uh, okay. So uh, based on what we observed in Kenya, uh, we actually interviewed the largest labor union in Kenya's private security industry. And most of its members actually come from the transnational uh, private security firms. And because of that, the major contribution of the Kenya's labor unions try to put in order, try to standardize the whole industry. So they, for example, they require all members should be properly equipped in order to ensure a safe uh, work environment, which means that get formal training and armed if necessary. So that's what I observed uh, in the field. Great, thank you very much. In the interest of time, I'm gonna ask only one more question and then we'll, uh, we'll go to the individual questions coming from the audience. So about norms and regulation, uh, the Cairo conference panels so far have emphasized the risk of an erosion of democracy and privatization in general of security hampers transparency and uh, democratic accountability. Um, South Africa and Kenya have led the way in Africa for national regulations. Uh, international regulations has revolved around the Montreux document, which indicated that the use of the term and definition PMSC should help with transparency. How have domestic and international regulations uh, evolved in your research? Uh, how have they improved transparency? Uh, the floor is yours, Janet. Sure, um, thank you for the question. I think uh, the, the issue of norms and regulations definitely is quite relevant. Um, in the field research that I did do, uh, I think in terms of the transparency aspect perhaps, um, we don't see that much, but um, some of the regulations that have been changing at the national level um, as various actors from the distribution side have adjusted um, to new projects that have come in and made adjustments to um, how to make those projects most economically beneficial to uh, distributions. Um, we have seen some of those regulations pop up, such as the uh, critical infrastructure regulations that I had mentioned before. Um, a lot of the process of negotiations between the Djibouti Ports Free Zone Authority and um, China merchants also have encompassed various um, discussions around um, regulating uh, the projects differently. Um, in the case of the Addis Ababa Djibouti Railway, actually, um, one of the reasons that, um, as I mentioned, there had been a derailment and some issues that came around um, was because of a lack of environmental consultations um, at the very beginning, at least that is what a lot of my interviewees had mentioned. So all of these are kind of um, learning opportunities, I think, for both sides and um, opportunities for new regulations to develop. Yes, definitely uh, regulation and certification is a compelling necessity 
for all the private security starting from China that operate uh, in the African continent. Uh, in order to have a proper certification, uh, you need for this kind of company, first, uh, basically to think transparency and accountability. And the proper set of regulation, as you mentioned, Marco, you mentioned the Mount Ho document, uh, that document defined the role of private military security. Why, for the specific case of a private security company, is the ICOCA. That is basically uh, a, a version for private security that uh, regulate in a code of conduct how this uh, company operate. Some Chinese private security and the one that I interviewed that operate in Africa, both of them, uh, Hai Weidui and Hua Xin Zhuang, uh, are certified by ICOCA. But we don't have to forget that uh, not only you can rely on this international organization, but also in the African continent, uh, the private security regulatory body in South Africa is well advanced in terms of uh, regulation and, and training for personnel. CIRA is the name of, of the association. So uh, if the Chinese private security company are incrementally increasing uh, their cooperation with these two bodies, definitely in the near future, we are going to say positive outcome. If uh, there is a failure, if the market uh, is still a race to the bottom, then we are going to have unaccountable, non-transparent uh, private security company that are also armed. Uh, so in terms of uh, regulation, I think the lobbying process among different st stakeholders in Kenya definitely increases the transparency of the, uh, of the policy. So as a matter of fact, there is a new uh, government uh, division called Private Security Regulatory Authority uh, is forming right now. And uh, it aims to uh, give uh, seats assigned to different stakeholders like industry associations, like local private secu security companies, foreign private security companies and labor unions. So I think uh, the problem is that uh, uh, the voice from uh, Chinese side is seldom heard. And this is because that most of the uh, security work we've seen um, uh, in Nairobi is kind of project based. So uh, the, the awareness to partic participate in the regulation and the lobbying process uh, still needs to be improved. Thank you very much. Uh, in the interest of time again, and because Janet has to leave us earlier, I will ask uh, questions for her first. Uh, there is Jean-Pierre Cabestan who says, hi, he said uh, he visited the free trade zone in October 2018. It was pretty empty. There was a hotel in construction and a few warehouses. How many Chinese, Djiboutian or other countries companies are present in the FTZ now? Charlotte Guo asks, uh, can you elaborate more on the implications of China's engagement in Djibouti to the Horn of Africa? For example, the competition of ports between CMG and DP World in Eritrea and Djibouti. And then uh, Wia Kyongpan is uh, asking uh, what share of merchandise is carried by the railway from the port Djibouti? Janet, over to you. Sure, um, all great questions that I think are quite relevant. So um, Jean-Pierre, I visited the, the zone um, a little under a year later after you had visited and um, my last correspondence with the ports authority, um, they indicated that close to 70, 70, uh, 70 firms had moved into or were starting operations. Um, I understand starting operations could be defined a bit loosely. So um, I totally understand. I think when I had visited as well, um, a lot of the, the warehouses had been constructed, but there didn't seem to be as much activity um, as maybe one would expect if, if firms are starting operations. So um, it would be interesting, I think, just to follow up now that it's been a couple of years since they've opened. Um, but that's sort of the current status that I know of. Um, and Charlotte, in terms of your question, yes, I think that's quite relevant. Um, I think we have to look very carefully at this um, as not just a one country, um, China merchants in Djibouti um, type of relationship, but obviously ports by their nature are um, a globalizing factor. And a lot of these port operators have a lot of other ports in the region as well. And that's what we saw in the case of DP World, um, a lot of other ports that they have, um, not just in Djibouti, but in, in the Horn of Africa and um, throughout uh, the region. And um, that actually having caused some of the tensions. So, um, I think that might actually be a very interesting thing that we, we might 
continue to see um, moving forward. And I think that the next part to investigate is looking at um, the network of, of Chinese, uh, China merchants' interests in, in the region and, and what that maritime network looks like um, and, and see how um, there might be disputes that come up in the future. Um, and the last question, um, yes, in terms of uh, the, the share of cargo. Um, so I think this, um, I'm not actually quite sure about uh, the share of merchandise or the breakdown of cargo, but I will say that uh, Djibouti handles 90%, close to 90% of Ethiopia's trade volume um, via, via its infrastructure. So that's quite significant. Um, and so I think, um, not sure about the breakdown, but um, in terms of just the volume, I think it's quite relevant to say that the railway would be quite important um, moving forward. Thank you so much, Janet. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you for sharing your research. Thank Have you very much, Marco. So we continue with other questions for um, most of the panelists, sometimes for one panelist in particular. Afanwiche asks, uh, especially to Alessandro, if uh, while doing your research, you came across incidents of demonstrations, protests, riots, and uh, were uh, Chinese private security companies called in and how repressive uh, or diplomatic were the Chinese companies in dealing with those demonstration. I'll uh, ask a couple more questions, group them, and then you will give uh, uh, the answer. Deborah Rautigam asks, uh, especially to Alessandro and Shu Wen, to elaborate on the use of African security personnel versus Chinese personnel in these companies. And relatedly, what kind of training do this company do for their African workforce? And then Junga asks, Yuna Park asks, especially for Alessandro and Xu Wen, contrary to the narratives of the China Inc. and China's dominance across sectors in Africa, research indicates here that there are multiple Chinese actors and in the private security, security industry, Chinese firms are latecomers and still playing catch up. However, we've also witnessed rapid growth and steep learning curves. Do you think China will catch up? and how long might this take? What will it take for them to become a significant actor? And now over to you, Alessandro, uh, one or two minutes. Uh, I still have three questions afterwards, so we'll try to finish in the next five to 10 minutes. Robert. Thank you. That's a very difficult task because there are three very important questions and all uh, in point. Let's start with the first one. Uh, when I was uh, moving from Djibouti to Eritrea and other area, uh, I didn't have uh, the chance to witness uh, any kind of act of violence, luckily, I have to say, especially for myself. Uh, and I don't have uh, much uh, uh, anecdotal report onto that. While I have it uh, on uh, several occasions uh, for Chinese privacy security operating in Pakistan, for example. Um, having the right amount of information is very difficult, uh, especially when there are insurance involved uh, in the case. So always the company try to settle locally uh, without trying to damage, uh, have a reputational damage for the overall investment. Uh, part of your question, uh, I link with the latest question, uh, with uh, the other question, the use uh, of local uh, force uh, by the Chinese company. Most of the time, uh, the army militia, the contracted policemen, former policemen, are local, are not Chinese. And this uh, is related to the fact uh, that the Chinese law still is in a gray area outside China, but uh, when uh, was established to define the role of private security in 1993, and it evolved in 2010, forbid Chinese uh, to carry weapons. So there is still a gray area in the use of Chinese uh, of weapon outside China, but then definitely is a gray area that can backfire quite fast. So if you see in the brochure and uh, mostly of the time on the spot, uh, Chinese uh, uh, work as a security manager with local armed uh, forces. Uh, there are some cases, and then I move to the, to the third uh, question uh, of specifically Chinese armed personnel, and this is on 
anti-parasimation. One of the companies that I interviewed for the report is Kwasin John An, and provide uh, uh, services, security services, mostly for Costco in, in anti-piracy capabilities. Uh, in this respect, uh, uh, when I researched in 2013, 2015, uh, the evolution of the Chinese security market from mainland China abroad, uh, I made uh, a big mistake uh, and I assumed that the Chinese are going to catch up in the security market in a decade, uh, while now, just a few years after, we are already seen, besides just the number is quite limited, but quite capable Chinese private security that learned uh, cooperating with their peers uh, from control risk, uh, G4S, uh, and so on. And another part uh, is the insurance sector from Lloyds, for example, from the United Kingdom, that is also driving the professionalization of some niche area, such uh, kidnap for ransom and negotiation. And I hope to have answered uh, in, in three minutes, Marco. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, First of all, thanks for all the great questions. So in terms of the uh, employment uh, for uh, Chinese and African employees, so because most of the Chinese employees in these private security companies have military background, so most cases they will serve as uh, officers to give the to uh, to provide the eva evacuation plan to, to provide training uh, curriculums to the local workers, and for the trainings that uh, a private uh, Chinese private security companies gave. Um, in a case of our uh, case studies, the trainings are very informal. Uh, in the case of CSTG, uh, they usually gave uh, the trainings once per month and about uh, just an hour at a time. So the training would include something like standard standing posture, Chinese language learning, and general risk management uh, education. Those are very basic uh, trainings. So in terms of whether uh, the, the competitive advantage of Chinese BICs and whether they can catch up with, uh, um, they can actually penetrate the market. I think maybe uh, Dr. Ying In Sa could uh, answer this, this question. Thank you for the question. So um, regarding the question on um, whether uh, the practice of paying public police officers to act as private security agents, is a particular Chinese practice or is also practiced by other private firms? The answer is, well, yes, it's definitely not a Chinese innovation. It's a practice that is widespread, at least in the Kenyan market. And this is because, as Alejandro has mentioned, uh, not only in China, but also in many African countries, the host governments have restrictions on what kind of weapon can private security officers carry. In Kenya, for example, if you're not a police officer, you are not allowed to carry guns. Uh, when you, even when you're uh, in the private security um, industry. So one of the, so it is a widespread uh, practice, but it's also one of the biggest dilemma in, uh, in my opinion, in the uh, public security um, industry in Africa. Because on the one hand, the reason why their argument that we need private security in Africa is because public security is insufficient to protect the welfare of foreign investors and, and projects. But on, on the other hand, uh, public police manpower are attracted to uh, being to act as subcontractor of private security firms because of the higher pays. So there is a dilemma in terms of the privatization of security in in Africa. And um, and uh, well, it's from our study, we haven't seen a solution to to the problem. But this has definitely become an increasing uh, severe the severe problem in in, in African countries. And the second question about the competitive advantage of, of Chinese companies in Kenya uh, and security companies, I'd say that the competitive advantage mainly lies with the demand side rather than the supply side, meaning that, as I mentioned earlier, the business for uh, security provision in Chinese overseas investment is over $10 billion annually. And right now, Chinese security firms have only accounted for less than 10% of that amount. So it means that there is huge market potential for providing security service to uh, Chinese companies that are investing overseas. And apparently, Chinese security firms, they have a better access and, and, and also a more experience for dealing, uh, dealing with Chinese clients. So I'd say that it's also, there is also, it's also in the interest of foreign companies to collaborate with Chinese firms in that regard. 
But of course, with regard to the supply side, there's definitely a steep learning curve for Chinese security firms that are operating in Africa. But uh, hopefully, um, for a company, big companies like Douwei, they've uh, learned uh, from their um, engagement in big projects like the SDR, and that they can also transfer this experience to other projects, construction projects in elsewhere in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Yinga. There's one last question, and uh, again, I'll ask you to answer in one minute maximum for each of you. The question is from Lina Ben Abdallah that we appreciated from the previous panel. She says, uh, I have a two part question. It's actually the question for Shu Wen and uh, Dr. Sia. Is the model of paying public police officers to act as private security agents a particularly Chinese practice? Or other private security firms do that as well? And the second part of the question what is Chinese PSC's competitive advantage in Kenya? or Africa more broadly, given that they are both a somewhat late comer and also, like you said, marginal in numbers. Now, the, the partially you have given, or given already a hint of an answer to this question, but feel free to elaborate. Alessandro, if you also want to add uh, uh, a line afterward, uh, Shuen, you can start. Uh, I think Dr. Xia uh, have already give insights in terms of these uh, two questions. So for the first one, um, we, what we've seen in the case of Doe and SGR is a great practice. So we would like to see more cases uh, in the future. And for the second question, the competitive advantage, I would agree with Dr. Xia's analysis before. Um, Ying or Alessandro, would you like to add something else? Just uh, that uh, it's quite common practice, uh, not only in China, but in all private security and especially private military companies uh, to have a kind of revolving door from the army and uh, from uh, the police. Uh, that's a fact uh, from the United States to, the, to Russia, and uh, we are witnessing it uh, in, in every area that uh, involve the, the private security. Great, uh, thank you very much, uh, Alessandro, Shuen, uh, Ying. It was a real pleasure to be with you here. I, I think we have finished and we'll hand over uh, the uh, microphone to Kevin, uh, unless uh, I can uh, actually end the presentation right here. Uh, um, by, organize, by thanking uh, the organizer and all the attendees, uh, and uh, we look forward to the next panel tomorrow, the last panel of the conference. And uh, thank you all for joining us today.